What's going on, YouTube? Rukar here. I am very much aware that it has been like a month since I played this game, but you know what? I, I had a lot of stuff going on. I was recording for a friend. I started playing way too many games, but it doesn't matter because you know what? We're going to finish this anyway, so let's just carry on, you know? Keep going with the WrestleMania bird. Oh, this is going to be such a hard voice to do. I remember that much. <laughs> Luke adjusts the rear view mirror. His eyes flash for a moment. He doesn't appreciate seeing himself like that, coming out of nowhere. Mirrors, he knows, are dangerous. Don't like looking at yourself? The engine revs once, twice, thrice for good measure. Luke's claws dig into the steering wheel's leather. The early morning sunlight coming through the windshield warms his chest and grazes his beak. He takes off, sweet and mechanical memory. It hardly takes a minute for the griffin to start humming a tune, a fine jazz hit. Washing off all that gunk, a good night's sleep in the back seat, and John's talk got him back up and running. Yeah, he could use some time in a different scenery. John was right. It's not like he has anything better to do or a job. The scenery shifts quickly, just as easily as Luke jumps from one tune to the next. He speeds up until the car's trembling and its individual parts are shaking, threatening to come undone. More, more of this sweet danger. Be nice to your poor car. Those things are expensive nowadays. And he would have gone further were it not for the blocky shape about a minute up ahead. How did he not notice it sooner in this flat desert? Because it's magic. It's a magic hotel. That's how magic works! He takes his foot off the gas pedal and allows inertia to carry him forward. He's still going fast enough that when he takes a right turn into the parking lot, the car swerves and the griffin is pushed against the door. He cackles with his forehead pressed against the window. The car comes to a halt precisely over the line, separating two rows of parking slots. Luke has broken his record by using not one, not two, not three, but six spaces simultaneously. So you're one of those assholes. His scar's stereo still blares jazz when he steps out of it, and he slams the door to the beat of the song. The tune is no more, but the griffin crosses the wide expanse of the parking lot, still humming the song, timing his footsteps to the beat. I hope you are off sync, because you are an asshole. Oh, this is a nice view of the building, though. He climbs the steps, clinking his claws on the handrail. The doors swing open as he lays his weight on them, and then he seals the deal with a final push that slams them into the walls behind. Be nice! I'm really glad I didn't make this guy the head of the lounge. He needs a good spanking. Hmm? No, don't. He probably would like that. <laughs> Luke's arrival is like a judge's gavel, silencing the world around him, and in the ensuing emptiness, his stride still follows the jazz beat. Ever since he set out earlier in the morning, he's had this contagious spring in his step. At any given moment, he could burst out in laughter or dance. But now, as his eyes adapt to the newfound indoor lighting, and he sees the man behind the reception desk, Luke's attitude changes. Luke takes off his glasses. Here's my boy. Who? Hey, you! Yes, sir. What the fuck happened to your face? Did a dog chew on it, brother? Oh, okay. Nope. N nope. Out. Out of my hotel. Out. Get, get out. Uh, uh, excuse me? You heard me. What happened to your face? And what kind of fancy thing did you do to get an LED in your skull like that? The Minotaur looks down, stuttering out an inaudible response. He bites his lip hard, and a rivulet of cold sweat, sweat runs down his back. Wow, that was hard to say. Jesus, if you want to look like some cartoon character, you don't have to rip half your face off. Luke's stride covers the distance between them before the Minotaur has a chance to think up an answer. The Griffin puts both of his hands on the desk and leans forward. He keeps his gaze locked on the Minotaur's empty eye socket, examining the flickering flame inside. <laughs> what a weird little thing you are! What even are you, brother? The Minotaur looks away and covers his face without a second thought. His entire back is soaked in cold sweat now. I I'm sorry. I know I am. And in a flash, Luke's contained laughter burst out like a dam. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, buddy. You should have seen your face right there. Now that must have been one nasty fight you got into, brother. But I've seen and been through worse. I know how it is. You wouldn't know it, seeing as I don't have any scars to show. But yeah, I've been through some shit. Ever been blown away once or twice? You know those old-timey stick-style grenades? Hurt like a bitch, brother. And there was this one time, and oh, look at me, I almost went on one of my rambles. I could spend all day talking about this such a fine piece of prime Angus steak as yourself. Okay, you need to calm down. I don't like him. I don't like him. Dragon guy's fine. Not this. 
Well, doesn't matter. I want to book a room here. This place must be pretty good, right? The Minotaur stumbles at the mention of the hotel. His gaze shows a blossoming warmth, all, despite all Luke's thrown at his face. Yes, it's quite a marvelous hotel, and I guarantee it will improve. It's very empty now, but it's sure to change in just a few days. Ah. Silence technology. I'll hold you to that. So where do I sign? What are your rates? Oh, yes. Just sign here in the ledger and fill in these forms. This is our soft opening. We won't charge you, good sir. <laughs> oh, so this place, is, this place is fancy and cheap? What's the catch then? I am sorry to say that there is no catch. This place has a mission, you see, and, well, we don't ever charge much. A mission? There's some sort of charity? I suppose that's a way to put it, yes. At least it was for a good while. It's up to the owner. Luke has been checked into the hotel. You can see your current guests on the guest screen in the menu or clicking on the ledger icon. Great. We got this asshole. A jingoistic, fun-loving griffin. We got four more folks to go. <laughs> Luke hands over the forms. The Minotaur takes a cursory glance at them. Mr. Lucas Walker, born in October 1923. Your looks are quite misleading. I'd never have guessed your age. You'd even be old enough to... Oh, you know how it is. Griffins don't age like Yumi's do, and I'm from a fine lineage, you see. I'm 3.125% Greek? And my papa was just like me in that regard, barely aged. Uh, I, I see. I'm sorry. I admit I've never met a griffin before. I don't know how it is, I'm afraid. Well, I can say the same. Never saw a minotaur myself. I thought you guys were just some old Greek legend. Cretan. Excuse me? A Cretan story, not Greek. Greece didn't exist when it all happened, about 3,000 years before Christ. Uh, for Forgive my impertinence. Here is your key, Mr. Walker. Your room is in the third floor, up the staircase, down the hall. I hope you have an enjoyable stay here with us. Oh, I'm sure I will, brother. And I hope I get to have a taste of Angus beef someday. I know he doesn't mean anything. Just go away. Chapter 8, Conflict Re Resolution. Yeah, there's going to be some conflict here between my fist and his beak. <laughs> After Asterion served you breakfast, you decide to stay in your quarters for the morning. Things that were alien to you are beginning to come familiar. The hotel that bends to your will, the Minotaur sworn to serve you, treasurous snake monsters, and the Japanese dragon that is now running a high-end restaurant under your roof. Thanks for the recap, me! You are slowly getting used to both your new circumstances and this routine, waking up, having breakfast with Asterion, inspecting the room, seeing the small changes in the hotel's condition and layout every day, having a drink and a talk at the end of the day. You once again look out the window in the master's quarters. Doesn't much change. Considering your phone is pretty much dead at this point and collecting your thoughts gets a little dull after a while, you find yourself doing this frequently when Asterion is into the room with you. With new guests coming in, dull moments like this are going to become less frequent. But for now, you can enjoy the moment of meditation and the warmth of your efforts bearing fruit. Something catches your attention, something in the distance. You squint and focus your eyes on the small red spot that must be several miles away. The shimmer produced by the heat on the road makes it very difficult to make any details. One thing's for sure, it's headed this way. Maybe it's a guest? You haven't seen any activity on this road since you first came, other than Kota walking over here. At least this time, it seems like the guy is driving a car. The car approaches the hotel. It swerves into the parking lot, making a loud screeching noise you can hear from your room. Whoever this guy is, he's either a terrible driver, a bad show-off, or driving under the influence. Maybe all of the above. I would not be surprised with this bastard. You see him step out and waltz into the main entrance. Whoever this guy is, he's piqued your curiosity. You rise to your feet, stretch your legs, and head out the door. 
As you walk out of the master's quarters, the lights blink and you hear the familiar sound of the walls and hotel closing behind you to conceal the walls of the hotel closing behind you to conceal your room. You are about to walk down to the lobby when you see something one floor below you. It's Kota. It seems like he just left his room and is about to head downstairs as well. However, his clothes are different from the Yukata he was wearing yesterday. Oh, you clean up nice, bro buddy. Today, Kota's wearing a formal, but definitely more Western outfit. He's dressed like an elegant barman. Oh, crap. What voice did I give you? Um, good morning, Rukar. No. I want to do an Uncle Ira voice, but I still don't think I can. Good morning, Rukari. Good to see you again. I see you're taking this restaurant thing seriously. You know what they say, dress for the job you want. I guess so. Again, thank you very much for your hospitality. I don't want to be a burden to anyone, so I'll gladly take over any duty I can as a gesture of goodwill. Kota bows in your direction. I was on my way to the lounge, in fact, or perhaps I should say the restaurant, to see if everything is in order in case we get new guests. May I know where you're headed? I was on my way to the lobby, actually. Ah, uh, great then. We can go together. You and Kota both walk down the stairs, headed in the same direction. I hope that you have an enjoyable stay with us. You and Kota make it all the way to reception. Standing there are Asterion and what seems to be a bald eagle griffin dressed very informally. The griffin eyes Kota up and down and is licking his beak in anticipation. Some deep, instinctual part of you sees the look on the new guest's face, catches on to what's about to happen, and screams at you to intervene. But like watching a train cl crash in slow motion, all you can do is stand there as the griffin perks up and grins. Well, well, what do we have here? Not one, not two, but three hot guys all alone in a giant hotel in the middle of nowhere? I must have died and gone to heaven. Griffin's gaze slides like a groping hand up and down your body and then flicks away to focus on Coda. For a moment, you aren't sure whether to feel relieved that he isn't undressing you with his eyes anymore or just a little bit insulted at being dismissed without a second thought. The name's Luke. Just got out here after a long, hard, lonely drive. And you are... A mighty fine piece of man. What do you say you help me with my bags and when we get to my room, I help you with your bag. I beg your pardon. The sound of Asarian's hooves clopping on the floor as he rushes over draws Luke's attention back to the Minotaur. Kota seems grateful for the distraction and shifts over to your other side, away from the new guests. Mr. Walker, please allow me to introduce Mr. Kota, the proprietor of the hotel lounge, and of course the master and owner of our establishment, Master Rukari. Master, huh? He looks from you to Asterion and back again with a widening smirk, his tail quivers behind as if electrified. Kinky, I approve. And I ain't one to barge into whatever you and Angus here got going on. Unless you're open, of course, in which case, you can do anything you want with me too, master. Oh, I... It's, it's not like that. Get your, get your dick in your pants. Behave. This is a good... Non-denominational hotel. Luke either doesn't hear you or is ignoring you. His focus has shifted back to flirting with Kota. The dragon tries to keep up a polite smile in the face of the griffin's enthusiasm, but you can see how strained the expression is by the way his brow and the corners of his lips twitch. And you're the pro proper <clears throat> uh, guy in charge of the lounge, huh? Nice. Been needing a place to put my feet up for a spell. Something fierce. And if I get to get served by an absolute snack like you, all the better. So where's the lounge at? What kind of drinks you got? And most importantly, are you single? I, uh, I, uh, well... Kota glances over, his eyes begging for you or Asterion to rescue him from Luke's lascivious interest. After a long, uncomfortable moment, the griffin bursts out into shrieking laughter and claps Kota on the back. Hey, relax, blue boy. I'm just teasing. Mostly. I'm awful sorry, I got a tendency to come on strong and end up putting my foot in my mouth. But I can take a hit when a guy ain't interested. He gives Kota a pat on the shoulder and then looks over to you and Asterion. 
That goes for you all, too. If I step over the line, feel free to tell me to shut the fuck up, all right? Please do. As you say, Mr. Walker. Hey, it's fine. You're still welcome to stay as long as you like. Just don't touch me. Indeed. Dragon gives you another look. You can tell that Coda has something he wants to say. And by the way, he's glancing at the Griffin, who still has an arm around his shoulders and an overfamiliar dresser. He wants to say it without Luke overhearing. Hey, Sterian, do you mind showing Luke to his room? Very well, Master Rukari. Nah, nah, you don't need to do that. I can find my own way around. And uh, I was just joking about that helping me with my bags thing earlier. I've got some stuff in the car, but I can get it myself. Nonsense, Mr. Walker. As keeper of the hotel, it's my duty to serve the guests in any capacity that I am able. Come on, Angus. You're handing me these jokes on a silver platter. And hell, I ain't one to turn down the help of a beefcake like you. All right, let's go then. I'm right. I'm on the same page as you, Coda. I'm almost positive, judging by the look on your face. The Minotaur and Griffin make their way to the front door of the hotel. Luke sauntering along as Asterion clops behind him. Asterion turns to give you a look right before following Luke out into the hotel into the hotel court courtyard, and you give him an apologetic grimace in return. Silently, you promise to come up with some way to make it up to him. So what's up? As soon as the front door clicks shut behind the new guest and Asterion, the dragon's polite mask falls off to reveals a frown of contempt. He brushes at the places Luke touched him, as though trying to keep something foul from staining his clothing, and then turns to you. If you will allow me to speak my mind, is that truly the kind of clientele you want to allow into the hotel? What do you mean? Kota gestures to the front doors, as though the source of his ire should be obvious. That sort of rude, shameless, utterly disrespectful person. I shudder to think of him putting on that sort of display around any other guests that may come in. It would drive anyone with a sense of decency away. Oh, come on, he doesn't seem that bad. One of the dragon's brows arches up high, almost touching the edge of his pulled back mane. Then Coda lets out a long, bone-deep sigh. I've dealt with more than my fair share of clients like that during my bartending days, and yes, Rukari, they are that bad. All they do is poison the atmosphere and ruin the enjoyment of the other guests. Better to turn them away at the door than allow them to make a scene. Or worse. I'm not saying this as an employee, but as a friend who wishes the best for you, Asterion, and the hotel. If you let a disgrace like that hang around, he's only going to cause trouble. Well, gee, blue boy, tell us how you really feel. It seems that Asterion and Luke made their way back inside while you and Coda were talking, and by the scowl on the griffin's face, he overheard pretty much everything the dragon just said. Shouldn't you have been able to see behind me in that direction? Luke stands there with his arms crossed, looking from Coda to you and back again as he taps a foot. The neutral mask slips back onto the dragon's face as he turns to give the new guest a low bow. Mr. Walker, I sincerely apologize if you overheard anything that the abrupt change in the dragon's demeanor only seems to piss Luke off more. He storms over with a squawk of annoyance, cutting Coda off. No, no! Don't you go back to that yes sir, Master Walker bullshit! Come on! If you got something to say, then say it to my face! You want to talk about a disgrace? How about a guy that'll smile in your face and then go, go around talking shit behind your back? If you had any kind of respect, you wouldn't pussyfoot around. <laughs> respect? The dragon bursts out into loud, sneering laughter and then draws himself up to meet Luke's flare with one of his own. Very well, if you will allow me to speak my mind, I have absolutely nothing to say to someone like you. Someone like me, huh? Luke pushes in closer, his beak snapping in anger as he glowers at the dragon. You're a real fucking asshole, you know that? And you, Mr. Walker, are a crude, disgraceful lech. Okay, ladies. Step off. You're both pretty. As Coda pushes Luke away, the Griffin's clawed, hand, clawed hands ball into fists at his side, but before Luke can do something he'll regret, you push yourself in between the two of them. That's enough out of both of you. Kota, we can handle this. Go and start getting the restaurant ready for any other guests that might come today. And Mr. Walker, Luke, you need to calm down. I sincerely, sincerely apologize that this is the first impression you get of our hotel. 
You're still welcome to stay. Our mission is to give anyone who needs it a place to stay for a while, and we don't turn anyone away. If you drop the Attitude and the Casanova Act, Asterion and I would be happy to make all this up to you. Not like that. I'm not having sex with you. You're gross. Fine, I'm sorry to you and Angus for causing trouble. He casts a petulant glare in Coda's direction, then Luke makes his way back over to Asterion to take the large, worn duffel bag in the Minotaur's arms and sling it over his shoulder. I'll piss off to my room and get out of your hair, alright? The Griffin guest doesn't spare Coda a single glance as he stops down the hallway toward the guest rooms. Once more, the dragon brushes himself off, then turns to you and Asterion. Do you see what I mean? I'm shocked that you allowed him to stay after that. You weren't helping. Asterion and I were handling it just fine until you talked about kicking him out. That didn't help, Kota. Look, I get your concern, and I want you to tell me if you think anything's going to be a problem, but neither Asterion nor I are going to just kick someone out because you got offended by something they said. And I don't want you getting into fights with guests over things like this, alright? We'll talk about it some more later. For now, go cool your head. The dragon lets out a huff of annoyance, then gives you and Asterion a shallow bow. Ooh, that's a big sign of disrespect. In Japanese culture, the depth of the bow determines the amount of respect being shown. And most respect is like either a 90 degree bow or like fully on the floor, but a shallow one? That, mm, that's kind of a piss off bow. Ow, I just punched my desk. I apologize for speaking out of turn. If you will excuse me, I will go to the restaurant to prepare it for any other guests we may receive. Though, to be frank, I don't want to see a single feather of that man's anywhere near there. You're really not good at customer service, my friend. Kota turns on his heel and stalks away toward the restaurant, still muttering under his breath. I'll have to put up a no shirt, no shoes, no surface sign, lest he take his clothes off and parade around in his underwear. Heavens, can you imagine? For better or for worse, it's over. For the time being, at least. A sigh forces his way out of your chest. What a start to your venture in the hospitality industry. One would be forgiven if such a confrontation left them on edge, but for someone like Asterion, after all he's been through, what impact could it have? You turn to him. Asterion, I'm sorry. I wasn't expecting things to take such a turn for the worse. Are you okay? The Minotaur looks down to the floor. His eyes dart to and fro as a hundred ideas skitter around his mind. Air hisses as he inhales through gritted teeth, and with each exhale his nostrils flare and tremble. Get a brief glimpse into Asterion's eyes before they close. What, what memories, what emotions are going through his head at this moment? And then his lips tense, but not in the way you expected. At first you have to strain your hearing to catch it. An occasional tittering, here and there like a harp string sweetly pr plucked. All at once the string snaps and in a burst Asterion's laughter spreads down the hotel's hallways and all the way down to the valley. He jerks to cover his mouth with a hand, and in doing so, he pushes pens and pencils off the desk. The gesture, however, only serves to highlight the corner of his mouth. Try as he might, they disobey him and raise themselves into a smile, and a single eye not to be left behind closes in joy. He rides out waves, from a stealthy giggle to a back-bending uproarious bellow. He hunches over the desk to catch his breath, and even between labored sobs, he keeps on smiling. He looks up at you through bleary eyes, streaked with shining tears. It takes him a dozen tries before he manages to spit out a coherent sentence. <laughs> Me? I haven't felt this good in a hundred years. Me? I haven't felt this good in a hundred years. This, this is good, my lord. This is what life is made of. I am alive again. Behind you, the door lets out a click no louder than a squeak. You turn around and find yourself facing a couple, just as they drop a pair of tall backpacks on the floor. The two stop dead in their tracks as they catch sight of the Minotaur behind the counter, heaving in an, out heaving in an outburst of hysterical laughter. And in that earth-shattering moment, their minds run wild, a hotel in the middle of a lifeless desert seemingly abandoned but housing nothing less than a Minotaur? <laughs> Look how this guy's face is just- what the fuck did I just walk into? A laughing bullman, in fact, whose boisterous bellows sound too song-like to impose terror. Asterion catches sight of the couple from the corner of his eye, but it does nothing to stop him, and in fact, the presence of an audience only seems to amplify his mirth. It does not last more than a handful of seconds, even if it feels like an eternity, for, the la for laughter to overtake fear and apprehension, for it to bridge the gap between the mundane world outside and the haunting hotel. 
First the lady approaches, and then the man follow as the pair make their way up to the reception desk. They look at you, then at the Minotaur, then back to you. Excuse me, but what is this place? It's a hotel? Her large, sharp eyes lock onto the incapacitated Minotaur as he finally regains a semblance of composure. Yes, but... What's up with him? Asterion is supporting himself against the wall, breathing slow and steady. Breathing slow and deep to steady himself as the aftershocks of laughter rock through him. It's a very special day for him. He hasn't had guests in quite a while, and right before you arrived, we had quite a commotion. No, I mean, what is he? Well, he's... Um... A man. Small is the gap that keeps mankind away from all sorts of earth-shattering truths. All humans, when given the op all humans, when given the opportunity to glimpse a secret, can choose to turn back and return whence they came. Forget what was beyond that sliver no wider than a door's breath, but laughter, that essentially human song, beckons. This is Master Rukari, and my name is Asterion. Here's your room key. Dinner will be served at 7 p.m. It is a pleasure to have you with us, and I hope you enjoy your stay. I don't know, it just seemed the most logical to introduce him as a man. Asterion's people, too. And now we've got dinner at the lounge, which I only hope goes well, but I'm not super hopeful. Ten guests have settled in by the end of the day. The hitchhiking couple, they had been backpacking through Eastern Europe before being pulled into the hotel, who will stay a day or two before proceeding with their journey. A duo of blue-collar workers from South America who seem to have stumbled on, a uh, stumbled on a roadblock on their work trip and are now waiting a few days for supplies to arrive. A gang of four college-aid students from the Middle East whose car broke down in the middle of nowhere, being pulled into the hotel spared them from a night shivering in the cold. And Kota, that very proper dragon. Kota's demeanor in the kitchen is as prim and professional as anywhere else. Before he begins, he walks from table to table, introducing himself as their server and giving a polite half-bow when he departs. At moments like this, the strength of his reliance upon rigid social norms is made clear. He treats the lounge like a restaurant, asking if the guests have food allergies and trying to adjust things accordingly so as to satisfy the greatest number of people with a single meal. The blue dragon also feels the need to run his choice by you and Asterion before he gets cooking. It looks like miso soup is what's on the menu. With the grace of a mountain stream, Kota gathers his ingredients and sets to work, focused and precise. He starts on the stock first, placing a few different items in the pot and letting their flavor leach into the water. You can make out seaweed of some sort going in first as the water heats up above a medium flame, but it is strained out just before the liquid comes to a boil. Once the broth starts rolling, he adds some kind of flaky material whose nature is harder to discern. Oh, it's uh, fish flakes. It's bonito. But when the scent of fish begins to perfume the air, you feel you've got a good idea what it was. Reducing the heat and removing what remains of the fish flakes, he throws in a couple of key additions. A finely chopped green onion, shredded carrot, and small cubes of tofu. To finish, Kota squeezes a glob of off-white paste into the ladle and mixes it until it's dissolved. You have to add the miso paste last, otherwise A, you'll ruin the flavor, and B, ruin the healthy elements of it if it gets too hot. The whole process takes about 20 minutes, but the dragon pulls it off with flying colors, quickly summoning a set of lacquer bowls and chopsticks with which to serve the soup. You watch them from the table a few meters away from the bar. Tonight's meal is simple. For such a large hotel, it would be deemed underwhelming, but with everyone huddled together, it's like being in a polite family dinner where no relative makes a fool out of himself. Even once the soup is done and everyone has been served, Kota doesn't seem to be content to relax. No sooner does the guest take their last lacquer bowl take the last guest take their lacquer bowl than the dragon heads back to the kitchen to make more. When you press him for details, he mentions that miso soup is often considered a side dish rather than a standalone meal in Japanese cuisine, and it's usually served with at least three other foods and a bowl of rice. However, most of the other dishes are simple to make and soon join the soup on the table. Brown rice, cucumber salad, grilled mackerel, and fried chicken. Ooh, a cucumber salad would be really good right now. Likewise, the rice is the only thing left plain. The salad is garnished with sesame seeds and homemade soy sauce vinaigrette. The mackerel is accompanied by shredded daikon radish, and even the chicken has freshly made tartar sauce drizzled on. Kota appears to have made a veritable feast, though as he asserts with a humble bow that this is all he could do with an hour's prep time, you tell him that it's more than enough. The guests seem to be wholeheartedly happy with the spread before them, but things hit a snag once all the food is on the table. Kota can only look on in mounting disapproval at the abhorrent lack of table manners, and his wide smile soon becomes strained in the same manner it did when he and Luke butted heads earlier in the day. 
More than a few guests struggle with the use of chopsticks, and the dragon is more than happy to give his wayward charges a helping hand, though he does not stop his lessons in the proper etiquette even once they've all grasped the basics. Oh dear. Even Asterion frustrates Coda in this manner, however innocently. The dragon lets out a sigh upon seeing that the Minotaur's hands lack the dexterity to, dexterity to use chopsticks, and continues buzzing about the dining room to lecture the less hopeless cases undeterred. When he, content when he comes to Greta's table, Ishmael catches the worst of it for teaching the others wrong. He his attempts to imitate, a Jap imitate Japanese culture are all based on anime that he's seen, and as a result, it backfires spectacularly when faced with the dragon's scrutiny. Sir, please, do not bring the rice so close to your face. The bowl is to be held in front of your chest, to catch the rice which falls from your mouth. To do otherwise would be most unbecoming. Oh dear, he's just a little too proper. No, not like that. Four fingers support the underside of the bowl, while the thumb rests on the side. Your other hand is for the chopsticks. It is acceptable to slurp your soup, but please do not belch in the other diner's faces. When the Frenchman reaches for the soy sauce and brings it to his rice, Kota can only point an accusatory hand and whisper, Don't you dare! Before he departs and begins to like, collect dishes from the speedier eaters. Okay, so we're going to have issues with this one too. Despite the formal atmosphere conveyed by Kota's meticulous de decoration, the guests speak with hushed excitement. They move the restaurant tables and chairs around to accommodate for larger groups if necessary, and sitting beside whoever they mesh with the best. Laughter skitters around, whispers and chit-chat hum and drown out the kitchen's noise. They exchange stories of their travels and how they found themselves here in the first place, but every few minutes you hear the whispers about the Minotaur, the Dragon, and the Griffin. Some guests were more apprehensive than others when they arrived. Seeing a Minotaur as a receptionist was a shock, but Asterion revealed a charisma and levity that captivated their curiosity. At a glance, he knew how to best address each guest. Some required reassurance, others did not think twice before stepping in and asking for a room. At times, he even joked about his own bullish appearance to break the ice. In turn, the guest's indiscreet glances and hushed whispers didn't even make Asterion flinch. It was as if he did not notice them at all. But now, over dinner, the guests talk among themselves. It does not cross their mind how peculiar it is that they all speak the same language in this hotel in the middle of nowhere. Though a number of them approach to offer you a word of thanks, the guests' high spirits are compliment enough, a testament to your hard work in refurbishing the hotel with Asterion. And yet, from just out of sight, you hear the clanging of washing dishes. So far, the Minotaur has spent the entire dinner hidden away in the kitchen. You still remember his laughter from this morning. Asterion hadn't been this lively before. Meeting the guests was a more joyful occasion than leaving the cold room by far. You can't abide him hiding away in the back rooms while everyone's having fun. I'll wash the dishes, you go mingle! I hate dishes, but I'll wash them for you, buddy. And so you make your way into the kitchen. Since Asterion has been cooking your meals for the last few days, you had no reason to return to the kitchen since you first arrived at the hotel. Tonight you find it looks nothing like what you first encountered. The silence, horrible stench, and strewn utensils. The silence, mm. The silence, horrible stench, strewn utensils, stains of food that had, been, that had decomposed decades ago, and of course the revolver sitting on the counter have all been replaced. Now clean stainless steel equipment, the sounds of Kota washing dishes, and the scent of the delicious food he had cooked fill the room. <sighs> Must be the hearth's handiwork, you think to yourself, but would the hearth alone have brought all these people together? You rejoice in a small moment of pride, seeing and smelling what you've achieved. The Minotaur and the manager are chatting while cleaning the dishes. They don't hear your approaching footsteps. Ah! Coat of ears on a short rant about what happened earlier in the morning, but Asterion changes the subject before picking up a pile of clean dishes. On the way to the cupboard, he briefly passes by the door to the cold room. He freezes, shudders, and lets out a nervous cough. After stashing the dishes, Asterion turns around, and only then does he notice your pres presence. Asterion. Yes? Would you like to spend a few minutes with the guests? You've been here all night. Oh, you should not worry about me. It is fine. The guest's comfort comes first. This is my duty, after all. But everyone's had their meal already. They're just chatting now. You could sit back and enjoy the company for a while. The Minotaur paces around and over your shoulder, getting a glimpse of all... Yeah. The Minotaur paces around and over your shoulder, getting a glimpse of all the commotion in the other room. His ear flicks to catch their voices, and he bites his lower lip to contain a smile. Ah, uh, you are kind, but I shouldn't leave Co leave Kota here to wash the dishes by himself. Kota huffs at the remark. I see. In that case, excuse me, Kota, do you mind if I steal a Starian from you for a few minutes? I'm almost finished here, and we aren't getting any more orders. Go on, Asterion. Have fun. 
Are you sure? I can stay a while longer. It's no trouble at all. It will not be necessary. Come on, I'm not giving up on this one. We both know you want to go out and meet them. Don't make me order you around. Very well. If Master insists, insists, then regretfully I must obey. But would you allow me a few minutes to have dinner first? You both walk away from Kota and leave him to his task. You haven't eaten? That's alright, of course you could have dinner. But you could bring your food to the table and eat with the others. It's up to you. I know you prefer eating alone, but if you take too long, the guests might return to their rooms. Now that is quite a conundrum, Master Rukari. How improper of me would it be to eat alongside others? However, it would be even more uncouth to hide away. Very well, you have persuaded me. Excellent. Dinner it is. Now what do you say we take it one step further and have a drink? It's a special night. The hotel's reopening. Let's not mince words. Wouldn't you say the occasion calls for some wine? He takes a pair of glasses from the cupboard before you finish speaking. You will never find me rejecting a drink. However, I will say, tonight you are revealing quite the honeyed tongue. It is not often I let myself be persuaded into such daunting tasks. What can I say? I'm supposed to put you to work, right? Also, I'm an English major. I'm supposed to be good with words. I'm only fulfilling my duty. Asterion takes his plate and a bottle of wine. What a pious lord. The gods would be hard-pressed to find another master as loyal as you. With food and drink in hand, the two of you return to the lounge. Heads turn in your direction and chatter dies down as Asterion's presence makes the guests lose their train of thought. The two of you take your seats at the end of the table, close enough to be inviting to the hitchhiking couple, but not so close as to force them to talk. The Minotaur wastes no time in pouring a bountiful glass of wine, first for you and then for himself. Cheers. To the hotel. And to our most magnanimous lord. To our hard-working, unrelenting keeper. To Emperor Rukari, may his reign be everlasting. Now you're just having fun. I'm... I might. Is that something Master disproves of? Disapproves of? I wouldn't be going along with it if I did. Asterion downs his wine. His Adam's apple bobs with each of his gulps until his glass has only a transparent film of purple. He takes a good look at it and swishes the final drop of wine around before refilling it. Am I not overstepping boundaries? Today has been such a lovely day, but I admit I've been forgetting my place. You don't have to be so formal. It's fine. What's wrong with cracking a joke? Perhaps there is nothing harmful, but some would say breaking hierarchy is always reprehensible. It is not often that I have allowed myself to speak in such a manner with a master. The Lord and I did not have to interact so much. Really? With you and I sharing the same living space, I'd expect it to be quite a close relationship. I mean, you're literally sleeping in the same room, just in a nook. Would Master allow me to speak my mind? You don't even have to ask him. Very well. Let us not talk about Masters of old. We have a joyful night ahead of us, and I hope for many more to come. Plus, from what little I gathered, it seems the world has changed so much over the last few decades. Not only the world, the people as well. Yeah, that's right. We have a lot of new technology, and maybe we, the people, have changed as well. I mean, not everyone's for the better, but a lot of people have been working really hard to be more open-minded and accepting of everything different. I didn't tell you about the internet, did I? I'm afraid you didn't. At least, I don't recognize the name. Oh, the internet is one of the most life-changing technologies from the 20th century. It's really impressive when you think about it. You are familiar with the radio, right? Yes, getting it to work here was a challenge, but it was worth it. All the songs. With a radio, you can listen to what people are sending from a distance. The internet is like that, but much more powerful. You can connect a machine to it, and it allows you to receive and send information. Isn't that great? What do you mean by information? 
Anything and everything. Well, knowledge, for example. You can send and receive messages in seconds. It's so fast. You can look at pictures from anywhere in the world. You can look at things of animals. You can look at art that people have made in half the time it would have taken in your era. It'd take weeks for a letter to arrive at its destination, but with the internet, it takes seconds. But it can do so much else. You can get books, see images, listen to songs, even watch movies in seconds. You had to wait for books to arrive at the hotel, right? With the internet, you can just pick the one you want and start reading it on your machine in seconds. And unlike the radio, you can make your own stuff and send it to the web for other people to enjoy as well. Nowadays, we even have what we call 3D printers. You can, let's say, find the information for a bracelet and print it out with the machine. Say, do you like art? Did the hotel ever have some sort of museum? I am afraid we were seldom graced with many works of art over the years. Here and there, a master would favor an artist and become his patron, but that did not mean the work stayed here. They were often sold. What we do have is what guests left behind as tokens of gratitude for the most part. Would you say you like it? Have you ever had the curiosity to see what's being produced? Certainly, if I am being honest, I've always had the curiosity to know how the world outside is doing. We talked about Notre Dame, yes? I've heard so many stories about it in so many other places. If only I could see these works of art I've heard so much about for a single day. You'll have that wish granted then. And if you like art, then it'll be your dream come true. I don't know how I'm going to figure out how to get internet into a hotel that's from prehist- uh, prehist- not prehistory, but definitely be serious. But we'll figure something out. Excuse me, but what? <sighs> Yeah, you want to see how the world outside is doing, right? See the art, the cities, the countries? The internet is great for that. In centuries past, the only way to witness art yourself would be traveling, either to a church or a wealthy patron's estate. As you may imagine, just journeying anywhere else, anywhere was an expensive, time-consuming, and often dangerous affair. But with the internet, you can see pictures, watch videos, and listen to songs almost instantly. Nowadays, there are museums that have the entirety of their collections available online for free. If we are connected, we are only a few minutes away from witnessing whatever work of art we want to. As you speak, you can't help but notice Asterion shifting around. His ears flicker and twitch, his gaze soon locks on and follows yours, as if enraptured. His tail, too, flicks back and forth as if electrified. The Minotaur's mouth hangs open as he struggles for words. That... that sounds delightful. Ah, master. This internet thing, it sounds as if I could witness the whole world from what you are telling me. You kinda can! To be fair, there's still a unique magic to seeing a work of art personally. Seeing a picture of a work in the real thing will always be different. The brush strokes, for instance, that's not conveyed too well in a picture. There's a sense of awe in seeing an impressive painting yourself. Regardless, the internet has largely made, has largely made culture free and openly accessible. Now, even if a painting is destroyed, let's say burned in a fire, it may still be preserved forever as information for generations to come. As well-intentioned as you may have been, the Minotaur seems lost in the maze of his own mind, and the ideas skulking about in his head don't seem all that enjoyable. He bites his lip and switches his tail, and from the tension in his arms, you can guess he's, he is digging his nails into his knee. Is something the matter? You seem a bit distressed. He jolts back to reality with an undignified snort, but still his lips remain sealed. Master, it is out of place for me to make a request, but nonetheless, would you teach me how to use this internet? You don't have to be so serious. Of course I'll teach you. Then you can see everything you want. You can see the world without leaving the hotel. The internet does sound exciting, my lord, but how do we bring it here? How does it work? Good question. You mentioned the hotel used to get radio signals, right? How was that accomplished back then? If you can get a radio signal here, then surely we can find a way to connect the internet. Oh, that. It was a challenging, although straightforward affair. We repurposed an old piece of equipment. It's an old thing, dating back to when the realm was created. The masters used it to communicate with the outside world. Before radio, it was used to send and receive letters, and before that, as a dock of sorts. We'd have repurposed, we have repurposed it for a number of tasks over the centuries. Oh, that's interesting. What's this machinery like? How does it work? Um, it's not a machine. It's more of a thing the gods left behind, perhaps not realizing how extensively it could be repurposed. If this internet is anything like the radio, then I am hopeful it can be done. 
Just a few feet from you, the Middle Eastern lads burst out in laughter. One of them shrinks back, ashamed. It would seem there is some sort of in-joke among them. Kota makes an appearance, and his large body flows around the tables as he refills glasses and gathers up empty plates with a servile bow and smile. Conversation dies where the dragon goes, and then resumes in hushed, excited murmuring, at least until his hand slips and a glass falls to the floor. The horrified expression on his flushing face cuts the tension like a knife, and the guests laugh and smile and wave away the dragon's embarrassed apologies with open, easy warmth. Both you and Asterion can feel it amidst the bustle that fills the lounge, that mixture of heavy melancholy and light fluttering hope swelling in your chests. Only now do you realize how silent the hotel had been so far. No footsteps breaking the hallway's monotony, no voices to bring new thoughts skittering to one's mind. The hotel's stagnant air made the both of you lethargic. And tonight, after eighty years of silence, that beast is vanquished. You look to Asarian, your newfound partner in crime, and his eyes his eye brims with the very same emotion. The voices, the raucous laughter, and the broken glass, the occasional look cast over the Minotaur and at you. It is like a liberation. You slouch in your seat, drifting down this current of self-satisfaction while Asterion downs another glass of wine. Perhaps your smile makes you approachable. Over the next ten minutes, two guests make their way over to ask a few questions and thank you for the hospitality. The same cannot be said for Asterion. As joyful as he may be, no one spares him a word, although you do catch a number of sideways glances aimed in his general direction. You try to integrate the Minotaur into the conversation, but you're met with the same walls time and time again. First, Asterion no longer displays the eloquence from earlier, and second, the guests cannot contain their stuttering around him. You scoot closer to the Minotaur when attention turns away from both of you, from the both of you. Sorry, is this too much for you? If you don't want to stay, it's fine. Oh no, I am enjoying it here. I really am. Everyone's so lively. I missed this. It is just that... So many voices at once. It is a tad confusing. It's easy when I'm talking only with you, but it's been a long while since I've been around so many people. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. None of this is your fault. Do you want to leave? The Minotaur swirls the wine in his cup, more as a distraction than in any attempt to draw out its aroma. He downs it, then leans back in his chair and enjoys the spreading warmth from chest to extremities. No. No, I just need a while to get used to it. Asarian gazes at his wine glass, its tinted purple from the last remaining drops. The Minotaur lets out a cough, clearing his throat from the burning sensation. When he looks back, he needs a second to focus on you. He moves with a languid deliberation, delighting in how tipsy he's getting. The Minotaur's relaxation, however, raises a tense silence. His eyes, drowsy as they may be, betray an intense purpose. What is Asterion thinking? The two of you remain in silence, alone in your thoughts, but not lonely. His ears flicker once, twice, twice. They strain to drown out everything else. The laughter and chatter, dragging chairs and clinking of cutlery, and focus on you. On your breathing, whatever words you might say next. He appraises your every feature, but latches on to your eyes. Your eyes. For a moment, it's as if he's trying to gaze at your soul, but a smile breaks his own focus. He giggles and looks away. Is, is something the matter? Ah, uh, the silliest thought overtook me. Have you ever looked at someone, a person you know, and quite by surprise found yourself seeing them for the first time? Ah, what a precious thing. For a moment there, it felt as if I had only just met you, and yet you were so familiar, Rukari. Maybe you were confusing me with a guest from a long time ago. No, no, that's not it. I'm sure of it. I can't place my finger. Perhaps not a guest. No, surely not a master. Oh, this old mind of mine, where is this coming from, this? I was trying to point it out, what it is about you that's making. I thought it could be your eyes, but... No, it isn't the way you look, but just... N but now I just... Have you ever felt as if you had hummingbirds tickling at the back of your skull? That's what I was feeling. But now I'm just looking back, thinking of a friend here and there. Isn't it sweet to taste old memories? 
I'm sorry. I don't know where I'm going with this. What just appeared at the corner there? What? What is this? I'm a little worried. I'm sorry. I don't know where I'm going with this, but remembering all my old friends, it feels as if they are all here again. It's just you and me, but I feel... Maybe I should be thankful for... Why is this lady just inching in? The conversation around you wanes and dies down. That is until you both notice a chair being dragged closer to Asterion and you. Oh, hello! Sorry if I'm interrupting anything! My name is Greta. I'm from Germany and I'm... I'm very... Oh, God, how do you do a German name? My name... My... Uh, mm, <laughs> I'm very curious. My name is Greta. I'm from Germany and I'm very curious. I'm grateful for this everything, really. My boyfriend and I haven't had a shower in a few days, let alone a good meal. The smell was becoming an issue. But you see, in a single day, I learned that there is such a thing as a minotaur and also a talking dragon in a desert. We were in Eastern Europe and now in a desert. That's a lot to take in, and let me say, I've always been a very curious girl. So if you don't mind me asking, how does this whole thing work? Non-human beings, I mean. Oh, we exist. Beings which aren't quite human. Here and there they pop up, but they keep themselves hidden. Greta, you ruin the moment! <sighs> N not the case here, where their charms don't work, their, tr their true shape is revealed. There? You talk as if you're different from them. In a way, yes. The Minotaur looks down to his empty glass, then turns his gaze towards you. Would you like some more wine? No, I'm fine. This is a good one. I'm enjoying every sip. Greta fidgets as Asterion pours himself a tall glass of wine. What is your story, then? Are you different from the others? Asterion keeps his gaze on the glass, but responds without missing a beat and with a peculiar, cold intonation. I was born here in this hotel. I choose to stay behind and care for it. But as you can see, things were not going well. Asterion gives you a quick glance, as if asking for your permission to proceed. You remain quiet, and he takes that as his cue. I was recovering from a few grave injuries, and meanwhile the hotel fell into disrepair because the previous owner neglected it. But things have changed for the better ever since ownership passed to Master Rukari. Greta looks you up and down, with a gaze so sharp it, seem it almost seems threatening. Why do you call him Master? What's, what's up with that? Asteria doesn't hesitate this time. That is how my family has always called the owner of the establishment. Our lineage has served them for a number of generations. That's why I chose to be here. This is my calling, and I am eager to see the hotel once more bustling with life, like it used to be. So, you're like a butler? Asterion nods, not bothering to look up from his wine. Have you ever thought about finding a job elsewhere? Asterion sways his head from side to side. And having kids? Do you plan on meeting a lady minotaur and having babies? I didn't mean to do that. I mean, that's how it works for you, I presume? A man and a lady minotaur? You aren't the son of a cow and a human, are you? Um, this is awkward. My parents were minotaurs. Oh, that's good to hear. How squeaky would the alternative be, yes? Now, about my other question. What about kids yourself? Little baby moves must be so cute. Asterion doesn't bother responding. He only looks at her in between his sips. Greta bites her lip and fidgets on her seat. I'm sorry if I'm being invasive. It's just it's all very new to me. To us, I suppose. Do these questions bother you? It is only now that Asterion looks at you. His gaze holds on you for a second too long. His smile, you see, has a tinge of fakeness. I am used to them. Is there anything else you would like to know? Lady, go away! About your eye, do you need medical help? My boyfriend is a doctor. We were talking about this earlier- this, We were talking earlier this afternoon about it. Look, we know there's more going on here than it looks. Magic or whatever you'd call it, but uh, is there anything a medic could do to help? You, you are very kind, but I'm afraid a doctor won't be able to do much for me. I am not exactly... Things function differently for me. But you don't have to worry. I'm well. It won't be long before I'm healed again. Oh, so you can grow your eye back? That's incredible. You know, it'd be great to study how you do that. Surely mod modern medicine would stand a gain from... I'm sorry, I guess that was too far. Pardon the curiosity, but where are you from? I'm from East Berlin. I grew up not too far off from where the wall stood, but I was born a few years after it fell. 
Da da, did you, did you have an accent? I'm sorry. My boyfriend is from Dijon, France, from the place where all the colorful mustards come from. I... I see. And what is East Berlin like? It's pretty good nowadays. Of course, there's still a bit of a gap, and it will take a while before East and West are truly equal. But it's charming in a way. Everywhere you'll see the little Soviet stick figures on traffic signs. It's so cute. And the nightlife, of course, is fantastic. It's Berlin, after all. This is going on longer in the scene than I thought it was. At the mention of East Berlin and Soviets, the Starian's eye flicks over to you for a fraction of a second. Then it jumps over to the other people around the table as you realize they're growing silent and directing their attention towards him. But well, we won't stay in Berlin for long. My boyfriend and I have wanted to live in England for years now, and we are trying to make that work. And we always wanted to backpack across Europe, so we figured now was a good moment. My twin sisters all did it. And I've- Twin sisters? <laughs> How many sisters do you have? And I've been hearing for years now how fun it was. So here we are! Now that Greta has broken the ice, people are looking, and Asterion grows stiff at the realization. You should visit us when we settle down, or just in Berlin too. That would be great. Imagine showing everyone a real-life minotaur. If money is a problem, there are so many excellent hostels, and you can run a place online too if you want privacy. The minotaur looks to you. It's no longer a stealthy single. He goes as far as to swinging his head from side to side as a call for help. You can't let him go through this. It's easy coming up with an excuse. Asarian, perhaps it's time we return to the office. We have some paperwork to go through before tomorrow, don't we? Ah, uh, yes, the contracts. Excuse me, Miss Greta. I am afraid I must get back to work. At this hour? Now that's quite late. That's not nice, Mr. Ricari. You shouldn't be treating your employees like that. You could say Asterion is more of a business partner to me, actually. We're in this together, and starting a new business involves a lot of sleepless nights. So it is with great pain that I must steal him away. If it's for the hotel, I'm happy to work all night long. Get us out of here. Greta looks at you, then at the Minotaur, and then back to you. As she does, you see her smile getting wider before her lips part and an obnoxious shrill giggle erupts. The Middle Eastern students turn around, startled by the noise. Oh, I see. That's Then that's okay. It was nice meeting you, Mr. Asterion. I hope my questions didn't offend you. Greta punctuates her sentence by smiling and closing both her eyes in a strained gesture. You fail to understand this for a moment, but it seems like she's attempting to wink and failing. I had to read that twice just to figure out what was going on. Don't worry, I am used to them. I hope you have an enjoyable stay with us. You and Asterion start rising to your feet when Greta speaks up once more. Oh, one last thing, I almost forgot. Is there Wi-Fi here? My 4G isn't working either. I don't have reception. Wi-Fi? Oh, that. No, not yet. I'll look into it. How, though? How can internet be brought to, a ma brought to a magical realm that just pulls people in? I don't know, and I don't want to know. We're going to figure out that in the next episode, because that went a little bit longer than I expected it to, and why did that woman have to cut in the middle of such a nice moment? Anyways, we're going to explain everything about recent history to Asterion in the next episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. Again, I'm sorry it's been a really long time between episodes for this one, but I'm hoping to get it back up and we'll see this through to the end. And eventually I'll finish some series and I won't have so many running simultaneously. I'm really bad at that. Those probably won't actually happen. Okay, goodbye!